Hey there, Dave Vlaitis, Can Am Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And <clears throat> I am here in the silo again. But I have some exciting news for you. For the last uh, week and a half, I've been on a, a major research trip. And uh, I was at a, at a series of probably at least 20 stops in 10, 11 days in Idaho. And uh, it was all on cases of missing people. And I took along the camera with me and we did four segments on locations that we went to. Some of them are just epically gorgeous. <clears throat> but as I've stated before, that when I go to these locations, I learn things. I learn a lot of things. And most of the time I learned that the way the story is presented by the press is not how it happened. And the area described by the media doesn't match the location where it happened. And it's, I mean, every day we left there just shaking our heads location after location, found new witnesses. It's, uh, it's a pretty bizarre 11 days. So what I did was uh, I broke these four into four segments. Each one's a story about someone who disappeared in Idaho at the location where they went missing. And they're long, they're between say 10 and I think the longest one's 17 minutes. And I'm gonna put these in between the major shows that we do like I've been doing the last few weeks so uh, probably every Friday for the next month I'll put a new segment up about this and uh, kind of breaks things up for you and you get to go with me and hear my thoughts about cases as I heard about them and as I learned about them while on location uh, it had nothing to do this trip had nothing to do with a movie it had to do with uh, getting back into the field before winter and uh, following up on a series of leads that people had given me about missing people in Idaho. And uh, let me say <laughs> that Idaho is a gorgeous state, really pretty, and the people were very, very friendly. Uh, I was in a series of small towns from north to south and town of maybe 10 or 11,000 stopping in a small cafe. Nobody knows who you are and they treat, they treated everybody like gold. I watched the way the, the server treated me who wasn't even from the area to the people that came in who were obvious tourists. Everyone was treated with dignity and respect. It was, it was an impressive, impressive showing of humanity at its, at its highest. And, uh, actually had a real enjoyable week. Uh, aside from the fact that uh, these were all about missing people, the people I met that were alive and well, really nice. I appreciated the time I spent there. Every once in a while I get questions. <clears throat> why aren't you doing this and why aren't you doing that? Most of the time they're good questions. And I'm gonna attack one right here for you person asked me, Dave, have you ever tried to compare DNA on missing cases? Great question. And a logical one at that. So first of all, your DNA is protected by federal HIPAA laws. It's medical information on you. And I learned long ago when I was in Silicon Valley to never take a DNA test under your real name because the data banks that store your DNA are eventually going to sell it to medical providers. If they don't sell it outrightly, they're going to sell it under the counter because medical providers want your DNA. Why? Because your DNA exposes a lot of the risks in your genetics. And really, medical providers are just insurance companies that are taking a risk on you to be healthy. If everybody under a medical policy was ill, medical insurance companies would never exist because they'd go broke. They're counting on young, healthy people to pay 
for the older sick people. And because the United States has an overriding number of unhealthy, overweight people, uh, they're, they're banking on the need for more young. So I was told by somebody in Silicon Valley who was involved in this, Dave, don't ever give your DNA or don't take one of those DNA tests under your real name because they'll use it against you eventually. Uh, so I never have. Uh, also, if you do this DNA testing privately and you're looking for parallels, it's really expensive. Not to go, it's not expensive to go through one of the DNA, public DNA testing facilities, but if you go through private and you're trying to compare genetics, etc., it can be really expensive. And I would never ask anybody in a family for another family member's, a deceased family member's DNA. It's just not in me. Now, if I wanted to get information, I could ask a family member because obviously they have similar DNA, but I've never done that. And I won't ever do that because I think that's an invasion of privacy. So, uh, the same thing for blood types. I hear this question all the time. Dave, uh, isn't, are the, aren't these uh, people that are being taken uh, or are missing, don't they all have the same blood type? <laughs> if somebody says they know this, they're so full of garbage, don't even listen to them. Again, your blood type is private information. A coroner at autopsy never classifies blood type. You see, in an autopsy, they have a certain amount of dollars to do the autopsy. They screen for a set 23 different types of drugs and narcotics in a system. They don't go outside because that costs more money. There's no reason for them to blood type anyone. Um, there's no, no reason for them to do DNA testing on anyone. They don't do that. They look for only one thing, cause of death, boom. Once they found out, done, everything's over. So if you think it's some big uh, forensic, intricate, secret way to find someone's cause of death, no, it's, it's very cut and dry. It's, uh, it's real no mystery and it, I've been to one autopsy from uh, start to finish. I didn't like it, I didn't wanna be there and uh, I didn't learn anything really, and I would never do it again. The people that do the autopsies, wow, very special people, and uh, we need them in our society, and I respect them greatly, but I would never do it. So, under the letters, and we got some good ones this week. Hey Dave. Ryan Day, the head coach of Ohio State football, has recently revealed his painful past of losing his father to suicide when his dad was 31. Ryan was only eight. Ryan had smothered his feelings, sadness, and anger of his dad's loss since he was eight years old. It was revealed today on October 9th, 2021 pregame show, and it was revealed to me and announced on TV. He rechanneled his pain and anger into a more productive life, and now he has coped. Ryan, is, Ryan and his wife, Christina, have organized and are huge supporters of mental health awareness, sensitivity, and support systems for more psych staff on hand for student team players, as well as other students. I'm not going to pretend to understand all Ryan Day and his wife have and are doing, but clearly they, seem, they see that there's a significant reason, especially after and during COVID pandemic, for additional psychological help for students. People are in a crisis daily and even more so because of the stress of today's new normal life. If your YouTube pros if YouTube persecutes David Politis for commenting and encouraging open dialogue of mental health and suicide concerns, then this is a shame and is criminal on YouTube's shoulders. Mental health is just as significant as cancer, diabetes, or AIDS. Why would mental health disorders be any less than these and YouTube feels it's taboo to discuss this topic. No one on this channel is encouraging suicide, but David's channel only encourages people to get help if they feel vulnerable to negative thoughts. We all need to hear David's compassionate message. To David, you're not alone in the struggle to stop mental health, a stigmatism, but a real issue that society needs to address. It has its taboo American issues like boys don't cry or a lifetime of suppressing true feelings. We do tend to be an emotionally constipated society. 
I hope better for my son now serving in the U.S. Navy submarines in Washington State, but for every other father, son anywhere where we've been brainwashed to think of showing emotion, grief, or sensitivity is a shameful thing. Not just boys, but my sister. And beautiful children. Inexcusably, she took her life. Mental health is just as serious, and YouTube can't deny that, although you are not offering counseling. You are acknowledging the issue. Maybe if I could suggest... I try to think that everything I do since my sister Liz took her life, I would try to be a better person and do good outwardly. You have a fabulous platform with lots of viewers. Give the sermons wrapped up in a mysterious missing people. People want to want the angle that you give. God bless you and Ben, Ben's mom. I wish you both the peace and grace of God that you will find peace. I appreciate what you do online, helping me and others. And I hope to meet you someday and thank you in person. Thank you. I appreciate that. And by the way, if YouTube takes me off, so be it. But I won't back down on the mental health issue. In fact, uh, Sunday was Mental Health Awareness Day. And I want to tell you that I was thinking about all of you people out there who write to me who talk about your mental health issues. I'm with you. Next letter. After listening to the comments made to you about this channel become a psycho psychology channel or suicide channel, I was offended for you, Dave, and infuriated for me. I have some insight. I haven't heard yet, so please be patient. On Sunday, October 10th was World Health Day. Although I have to listen about COVID every day for the past years, my ears may bleed. Why isn't mental health a larger focus? The lifestyles of most people have been so drastically impacted by the lockdown, quarantine style, working from home, or now losing your job for refusing a vaccination. Mental health has to be a bigger focus. Yeah, right on. Uh, today, big in the news is uh, Southwest Airlines and their pilots look like they went on a sick out because uh, they're getting forced vaccine. And uh, I've already heard that many of the pilots have had COVID, so have natural immunity. So why push the vaccine on them? Because I've done my research on this. Finland, Denmark, and Israel have all shown that if you have had COVID and you have had, and you do have natural immunity, that it is up to, this is according to them, 27 times more effective than the vaccine. Impressive. I've had COVID, so I think I'm in good shape. On the news recently out of New York City, a nurse was refusing to get vaccinated for personal reasons. Her argument was pure and simple. I was demanded to come to work during the onset of COVID and did so gladly. Never got a vaccine during the early months because it never existed and worked around the clock and was praised for being a frontline worker. Now there is a vaccine and I have to get vaccinated or I get fired. Where is the justice in being a frontliner and then have the proverbial gun to your head or get vaccinated? Give everything and get nothing in return. The tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut are having a nightmare shortage of nurses, nursing home, caregivers, home care aides as well, school bus drivers, crossing guards, school teachers. But wait, because of my job, imports of every kind are delayed in a way most Americans can't comprehend. There's a shortage of dock workers, forklift operators, truck drivers, and expediters. My washing machine broke down one and a half months ago. I bought an American-made machine and it took two months to be delivered in a tri-state area. If you go down to the boardwalk along Coney Island, Long Beach, or Jones Beach, you'll see a myriad of shipping freighters lined up waiting for admittance to be offloaded in the Atlantic as never seen before. Sitting on the horizon is a freighter armada with no one to offload their goods. Goods. COVID has been a tragedy physically for many. No disrespect to those infected or lost to the disease. I only mean to say that it is an enormous impact on our financial and economic system. I wonder if this is a retaliation that China, he's saying that the U.S. has nearly a $27 trillion debt to China. Coincidence? There is more a need for mental health awareness than ever before. If this is a doubt and you believe in these theories, put on your seatbelt and get ready for this. If you got vaccinated, did you pay an insurance for it? For most people, it's free. 
But while getting vaccinated, I asked myself, when did ever, anyone give me something for free? Life-saving free? No strings attached? I was asked if I wanted my data shared with the state and federal governments on a waiver. I said, no way. I don't think I needed the vaccine anyway, since I always work from home and Uncle Sam pays my bills. Grandpa Biden made me forcibly get vaccinated to keep my job, even though I have no physical contact with outliers. Every pharmacy in my area is a hard selling is hard selling every other vaccine available. Is this the trade off? Get a free COVID and get a flu shingles hep C shot at half price. Pharmaceutical companies are getting rich off these vaccines and don't think otherwise. Nothing is free. Where's the payoff for them? Where's the money going? Sorry for the tirade. Missing a year of school sounds like a kid's dream, but elementary school life, making friends, the building blocks of education, developing a relationship with education, AP courses, proms, SATs, SATs, varsity recognition, meeting the love of your life, forming the basis for a college resume, future college scholarships, helping to finish a degree, advance to a higher degree, if an athlete, going to the pros or the Olympics, internships, canceled, etc. I can't say it all, but we all know the hardships for us all. Why? Which is why when I hear that Dave Plytus gets flack from YouTuber viewers about his openness towards mental health and suicide makes me irate. We're bombarded, yeah, we're bombarded with drug ads on TV every day. <laughs> Let me say something about this. Angie and I were sitting on the couch the other night and uh, we were watching something. And uh, within an hour, there had to have been eight different ads for eight different drugs or narcotics sprinkled in with three different types of vaccines. And we looked at each other and said, did you just see all this? Wow. <laughs> and then I wondered, do people watch these ads on TV then think I might have this and go to their doctor and say, hey, I want to get this drug? Because why else would a pharmaceutical company be advertising? Back when I was much younger, I don't ever remember seeing drugs advertised on TV. Maybe aspirin, Tylenol, Advil, but you don't really see those drugs advertised on TV much anymore. It's these hardcore vaccines and drugs. It's amazing. We're bombarded with drug ads on TV every day. Many are ads for the treatment of mental unwellness and we gladly accept that most of the time not understanding the, the ad's direction, but we listen to it waiting for our program to come back on. We are numb to advertisements, but David, although not a doctor nor professed to be, offers open dialogue for people that may share in a way to paint it for losing, losing a son. If you, want to, if you want to troll a poor man that is trying to make something great from his loss and pain by helping others, then I really feel sorry for you. We are a village. We need to be supportive of each other and will. Whether you want to contribute with your own story of pain or a simple pat on the back of encouragement, life is precious. We all need to embrace the short time we have and if making a fellow person comfortable, reassured or loved, really? How much does it cost to say a kind word? Nothing. <laughs> Sunday, October 10th, 21 is World Health Awareness Day, but in reality, with all the troubles in this world, every day should be awareness, action and compassion towards those that need help. These are troubling times and you may want to be surprised and you may be surprised there may be someone beside you going through difficult issues. Stop right there for a second. I can almost guarantee there's somebody in your life right now going through a horrific time. And many times it's the most upbeat person in your environment. The man I think about when I talk about this is Robin Williams. There was nobody when he was on a stage that, that was more upbeat, interesting than Robin. And yet inside he was in, he was living in hell, which is why he eventually took his own life. And don't think that the people around you, because they're upbeat, friendly and positive are the ones that are doing great. Maybe just the opposite. Don't be afraid to ask people how they're doing. And if somebody says they're really depressed and you think that they're maybe thinking about taking their life, don't be afraid to ask them directly about that. 
I know your first instinct is, oh, don't do that. No, no. Ask them. Are you thinking about taking your life? It's not a bad question to ask. Engage them. Be interested. Show empathy. Back to this. <clears throat> God bless us all, and Dave replies, for making mental health less a stigmatism and more an open forum. You should be praised for making this not a dirty secret, but open to people who we feel who may feel troubled. My sister took her life recently, and personally, I'm still trying to cope. If David and I can help one person, then I feel that's a win. Thanks for that letter. A little different type of letter here. <clears throat> Dave, I hope this finds you well and safe. I'd like to dig a little deeper into this subject by starting with, if people don't find the information you're presenting terrifying, then they aren't paying attention. <laughs> in bold letters. The vanishing people, gruesome deaths in indeterminate cause, missing planes, cattle mutilations, to me are way beyond anything in religion or science. As you once stated, paraphrasing, the cattle that are mutilated are taken somewhere, drained of blood, parts removed, then dumped back where they are found. They could have put them anywhere, but they didn't because they are sending us a message. I said that. It's apparent that size or mass are no hindrance to who or what is performing these acts. Add to that your discovery that at least a few of the deceased victims had GHB levels way above normal, thousands of times above normal. This further begs the question, was the ability to produce GHB naturally in the body put there for a purpose? For just the purpose of elevating levels at will? To me, this further asks, did the intelligence that manipulates GHB levels actually synthesize us to begin with? Does this mean no creator or panspermia, panspermia created us, but we are the product of an intelligence that is absolutely unfathomable to us? Is our universe actually sitting inside an aquarium tank or a virtual reality in a dimension unknown to us? This intelligence absolutely knows when there are no human eyes on the victims, animals, or aircraft they take. To me, no one, no one must ask, are we nothing more than guinea pigs, lab rats, or worse, an amusement or sport? There's not one speck of benevolence in any of these occurrences. I, I must now question everything. Crop circles, Bigfoot, so-called miracles, UFOs, I knew a neighbor who had a serious lung problem. He had a bottle of oxygen with him at all times. One day he went in for a checkup and his chest x-ray came back clean. His doctor looked at him and said, is this some kind of joke? Yes, he lived longer, but he still died and probably suffered from other complications for a long time. So did this intelligence create this miracle? Or was this intelligence just having fun I mean, let's face it, anything that can remove and replace one ton animals, steel aircraft, abduct people, can do anything it wants. By the looks of it, it can also control matter down to the atomic level. Raise GHP levels? Check. Cure lung cancer? Check. Kill people and leave no discernible cause of death? Check. Your project has raised some serious questions. Our world, this universe, is not what we think it is or want it to be. I feel sorry for my kids and grandchildren. Will they be one of the abducted someday? Will they be tortured and brutalized? Carl Sagan stated, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But here we have extraordinary evidence. But to what claim? Rock climber vanishes midair? Mount Rainier. Toddler found dead two miles from home wearing a different diaper? Washington State. Dead men found in ceilings in hospitals? South Africa. These happenings are inexplicable. Isn't it time to think way outside the box? Should we sound the alarm? Are these events merely a precursor to a coming terror? And the worst question of all, should we accept that procreating is nothing more than producing fodder for this malviolent overlord? I don't see any good coming from this. Stay safe, if that's even possible. <laughs> Brilliant letter. Brilliant. <clears throat> the aquarium 
theory is interesting. And I've stated to you before that I've thought about us being an ant in the ant farm. And <clears throat> just like we stand outside that glass wall in that ant farm and watch them create, move, build, just like what we're doing here. It makes you really, really contemplate what's going on. And I wish I had the intellect to figure it out at this point, but I don't. But I am smart enough to understand that this is an all natural, meaning it isn't occurring on its own. Something's happening. Now, at least once every three days, I get an email from somebody saying, oh, what are you pushing your garbage for? Uh, you know, you're just a conspiracy theorist pushing crap and blah, 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 blah. So I get through like the first three lines and I just dump the email. But I'm amazed at the number of people that are willing to blankly dismiss something without ever doing serious research about it. A lot of people send me an email and say, well, I really don't know much about what you're doing, but I'm interested. And could you tell me something about it? Well, obviously I could tell you 11 books about it and two documentaries. So I wish I could devote the time to long and extensive answers, but I do give that answer I just gave you. And I tell them, hey, go to your local library, find a book, Missing 411 book and read it. I'm ecstatic anyone's interested at this point. I'm very frustrated that we haven't grown as fast as I'd like to grow in getting the word out there. I still get people every, every week that say, hey, uh, you're a proven shyster and uh, you're, you're proven to push hoaxes. All I have to do is look at your Wikipedia page. Yeah, yeah, as I've told you before, that Wikipedia page for David Politis is brutal. I've said, I'll say it again, I've had some of the highest people in Wikipedia that were editors that cannot change that page. Somebody very high up has controlling interests and is being, is making sure that nobody, nobody changes it. Go look at the page, it's disgusting. I can't get over it. Let people believe it just on its face. Now this week I have three cases for you. And uh, two out of the three are very recent. One is older that I was waiting for information on before I talked about it. But uh, talk about the first case. It involves two people who disappeared. Both were National Park Service Rangers, both retired. And one of them was a Navy SEAL in his earlier years. Kim Krumbo, C-R-U-M-B-O, 74 years old. And his half-brother, Mark O'Neill, who's 67 years old. They decided to take a four-day trip in Yellowstone National Park to Shoshone Lake. Shoshone is the second largest lake in Yellowstone. And it's, uh, it's a beautiful place if you've never been there. This is Mark. Well, both of them uh, left on their trip and told family and friends that they were going to be back on the 18th of September this year. On the 19th, they were reported missing. Uh, on 920, Park Service went out and immediately found Mark O'Neill on the eastern shore of Shoshone Lake, dead. He was on the shore. He wasn't in the lake. Now, Kim Karumbo was a huge conservationist. He lived in Ogden, Utah. He had 10 years experience as a river guide, 20 years of experience with the National Park Service. Younger years, he was a Navy SEAL. And just so people understand Navy SEALs and why they are the toughest of the tough, 
is because they train in the cold waters of the Pacific Ocean off San Diego. In San Diego, Pacific waters are a little warmer than Northern California. In Northern California, a place where I dove for 30 years, uh, from the time I was about 10 years old, the water there can get down to 48 degrees. If you don't have a quarter inch wetsuit, you, you're gonna die. And you could probably live in that water for maybe 30 minutes. Interesting thing is that 48 degree temperature is the same temperature of the water almost year round at Shoshone Lake in Yellowstone. So the National Park Service starts doing this search. And along the far eastern banks of the lake, they found a canoe, a life preserver, and one paddle. They found a recent campsite on the south side of the lake. Now, on the northern, northwestern side of the lake, there's actually a campground called, I think it's Grizzly Bears Campground. I gotta look here, I'll show it to you. But they uh, did put in underwater submersibles, they flew drones, they've hiked the area dozens of times since uh, the 19th of September. And as of yet, Kim hasn't been found. Now, why do I bring up Kim and his prior service? Because it is extremely important to know that some people have the ability, whether it's mind over body or whatever, they have the ability to live longer in colder water. Well, Kim had that ability when he was young because to be a Navy SEAL, you've got to do this in cold water of the Pacific Ocean for hours at a time. Most people can't do it. And Shoshone Lake had that cold water. If he was in a canoe with Mark and it overturned, Chances are Kim should have survived over Mark just because of his abilities. Now granted, those were decades earlier, but I still don't understand why Mark hasn't been found. So far, it's been a three-week search. Uh, Mark was also a contributor to the Salt Lake Tribune where he wrote outdoor articles. He was a member of, of numerous conservation groups. He was a good soul. And both of them spent much of their life working for the National Park Service and educating people like you and me. Good people. I can tell that the Park Service is giving this their all, trying to find Kim. And again, the chances are, if he was in the canoe with his half-brother, then I hate to say it, there's a, there's a good chance, and I think they know it, that he might be in the lake. Apparently, Kim or Mark made it to shore and died. And the coroner stated he died of hypothermia. Now, the weather had been cold in Yellowstone and they've already had their first snow. If you fall into a, a lake and it's 48 degrees and you get out and you cannot immediately get a fire going and it's anywhere around 30 degrees outside, chances are you're going to die of hypothermia. Water, cold water, has a way of draining your body of heat quickly. And if you get out, your clothes are wet, that means water is still ripping that body heat from you. If you take those clothes off and you have no way to get dry, no way to shelter, you're in bad shape. It does appear that Mark was able to get out of that lake alive and then died on its banks. A very, very sad story. But Kim still hasn't been found. Don't take these lakes in these cold areas lightly. One last thing I'll add to this. It was obvious that somebody wasn't wearing a life jacket because they found one on the banks of the lake. I can't tell you the number of times I've read about people dying and a life jacket was in the boat or in the canoe or in the kayak with them and they didn't they weren't wearing it i can't tell you the number of times and 
that life jacket is made for a reason. Even though you can swim really well, if you fall into the water in the middle of a lake and you're not in decent shape and you get a cramp in your leg, chances are you're going down. And cramps are debilitating. So, how great a swimmer you are is not relevant in my book. Uh, I've been out and I've had a boat in my life and I always make sure that everyone on that boat at any time knew where their life preserver was at and if you're going to go skiing, if you're going to jump outside that boat, you're going to have it on. So it's one of my pet peeves and I wish that everyone take, would take heed to it. So anyhow, yeah, that's Kim Krumbo and Mark O'Neill. I hope that uh, Kim and Mark's family can get through this in one piece without losing their minds, because it's tough. The next case, I know I'm going to get like 15 people sending me emails, because people like to do this. Correct your pronunciation. So, the lady's name is Narina Avakian. She was 37 years old. She went missing March 7th of this year in LA County. And it was in the mountains. Whoa, let me, let me finish right there before I forget. I always forget this. So this was, this was Kim, Kim Krimbo, missing in Yellowstone National Park. Now, this is Shoshone Lake campsite that was a recent one. They never said it directly belonged to the two guys, but they said it was here. This is North Grizzly Beach. And we always say, locations get a name for a reason. Well, if these young, or if these men camped here, they were smart not to camp here. I would never camp there. That got the name for a reason. Stay away from that side of the lake. Now, on this side, they found the equipment that I told you about, and they found Mark's body. They still have not found Kim. That's Shoshone Lake. And just for, as a reference point, this is the Yellowstone caldera up here. Okay? Now, this is Miss Avakian. 37 years old. She had a bachelor's degree from Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. She was a 15-year graphic designer, 11 years with the same company. She was someone who loved to hike, did it weekly. She was in tremendous shape. Many times she went off alone. Sometimes she went with groups. On March 7th, the day of the hike, she called her family, told them she was going for a hike. She'd be back that night. She didn't tell them exactly where she was going. But the next day, they tried to contact her. They couldn't. Phone went dead. And they called the sheriff. So... Stop there for a second. What's the one item I push the hardest for hikers to carry? Yeah, personal locator beacon. Now, I'm not going to tell people not to hike alone, but I'd prefer if you didn't. But a lot of times, single people have, some, have a difficult time finding somebody to hike with. So they go out and hike alone. I have a lot of friends who do this. But, but, Carry a personal locator beacon. Whew. So, Miss Avakian, she didn't tell her family where she was going, but she did tell them she was going to go, and they did call the sheriff the next day. So I give her credit that she told somebody she was hiking, but she didn't say where she was going. You got to do that. Then you got to tell them when you're going to be out. And if they don't hear from you by a specific time, they're calling the sheriff. Well, in this instance, a relative was called the next day. And the problem was they weren't sure where they were looking. So they had to get a subpoena to ping her phone. And they pinged her phone at the bottom of a canyon in LA County, along an area with the San Gabriel Mountains. Well, it was actually not long after that, that they found her Subaru Impreza 
parked in a parking lot of the Buckhorn day use area at 6,000 feet. Once they found the car, they immediately put resources into that location in the way of search and rescue. LA County did the search. Now, since the day she went on the 7th and the day her car was found on the 11th, between those days, there was a foot and a half of snow. Now, the day she was on the mountain, it didn't snow. Remember that. They try to blur this. And I'm telling you, pay attention. And this is why I was waiting for the facts to come out about this case to say anything. So, the sheriff puts out a bulletin and says he wants helicopters, multiple agencies, blah, blah, blah. And he gets 25 search and rescue teams from 17 counties and three helicopters. That's an unbelievable response for LA County. Congratulations, men and women, that is tremendous. And they put them on the trail with their canines. Now there's snow there. Now, on the there are five different trails that leave from this parking lot. And one of them is the Mount Waterman Trail. Two days into the search, at about 1.30 in the afternoon, they find her body, just a little bit off the trail, not a lot, and she's deceased. The LA County coroner takes possession of the body, and about a month later, they release the cause of death as hypothermia. Hold your horses. It didn't snow the day she was out there. She would have been off the trail by four or five or six o'clock. Weather, really bad weather, came in late that night and the next day and the following day. She was found at 8,000 feet in elevation. She entered between six and 6,500 feet. The sheriff said that there didn't appear to be any foul play, but guess what? The LA County homicide team for the sheriff's office took the case and opened an investigation. Some of the newspapers said, oh yeah, that's just standard operating procedure. Okay, no foul play, missing person. Why are they opening a homicide case? I think there's much more to this case than many people want to tell you. And therein lies the reason that I'm interested in this incident. This lady was very smart, single, hiking alone in an area where there have been other disappearances. Now let me show you. So this is the area. This is the Mount Waterman ski lifts. This is the Buckhorn day use area. There's trails on both sides. This is the main Angeles Highway going through the mountains. This is Mount Williamson, Mount Lewis, Winston Ridge. Windy Gap Trailhead. This whole area and this road on weekends is very heavily populated. So, do I think something happened to Miss Avakian? Yes, I do. Do I know what? No, I don't. And the evidence is that LA County Homicide Team has this case. They haven't said that they've closed the case. They did say that the cause of death was hypothermia and the coroner also said accidental hypothermia. I don't know what that meant. Cause of death was maybe accidental with hypothermia being the cause, but the wording was strange. So, case number two. Third case is a case that many of you wrote to me about and said, Dave, would you have a look at this? And right off the bat, I knew, I mean, I've been following it just like everybody. And that was a case of Chris Ramirez, three years old, uh, out of a place called Plantersville, Texas. You know, I've learned that it's very hard for people who are not parents to grasp these these cases that involve small kids. 
I don't know why. Maybe because we've lived with kids for so many years, we know what their abilities and inabilities are. But Chris went missing on October 6, 21. After his mom and he came back from doing some shopping. This is in a rural area of Texas. And This is Chris. So mom and uh, the boy return. Just as Chris gets out of the car, neighbor's dog runs over. And this is in an area called Firefox. There's a couple streets named Firefox in Plantersville. And it looked like the properties all are very large, meaning an acre to two acres each. No fences. You can see your neighbor's home. Well, when they came back, this neighbor's dog runs over. Chris goes out, runs over to it. The dog runs into the woods. Chris runs into the woods. The mom said only a couple minutes went by. The dog came back. Chris didn't come back. Well, she looked, went into the woods, called for her boy, yelled for her boy. There was no answer. She came back in, called the sheriff. Now, not long after the sheriff calls for search and rescue, guess who calls? The FBI. And the FBI offered their resources to help in the case. Now, they have a special exemption in their investigation protocol that says that they can become involved on disappearances of small children. And I've never, before I got into Missing 411, I never really understood why that exemption existed. But now I do, because there's so many suspicious missing children in the woods, and the FBI just miraculously shows up and starts, you know, doing everything they can to help, because I think they're trying to understand what's going on. Well, the sheriff put in drones, helicopters, canines, and they start searching all over. Canines weren't picking up a scent. Just like in the Viking case, no scent was picked up. 40 agencies from around Texas, private and public, contributed to the effort to find Chris. And it was almost no, haul, no holds barred. Everyone was searching through those woods. And that was for three days. How can he not be found if he was there? Explain to me. 40 agencies, 200 searchers, 300 searchers. So search protocol says that a young child, two to three years old, should be found 95% of the time in an area between two to three miles from the primary location that they went missing from. And that's where they were concentrating, I have no doubt. Now, on the third day that Chris was missing, a man named Tim Halfin was in a Bible study class. Yeah. And they were talking about this case. Tim said that at the end of class, he went home and he felt like somebody was talking to him. He said he thought it was God. And he was told to look for the boy on his property. Say what you want, folks. I've told you similar stories many times where people have dreams. People get told to do something and they go out and they do it. Tim listened to that inner voice. He started walking his property. A rural property southeast of where the victim disappeared in a wooded area he's walking along and he hears a voice he turns and looks there's christopher in the grass in the trees alive he said he couldn't believe it went over there picked the boy up he said the boy wasn't shaking he was talking he was coherent. And at about 11.15 that morning, Tim made the call to search and rescue saying that he thought he had Christopher. Well, the ambulance arrived. 
and they took the boy to, ch to Children's Hospital outside of Houston and he was diagnosed as being dehydrated and he was hungry and the following day he was doing better and he's even doing better now. Now what's phenomenal about this? The whole story's phenomenal. <laughs> Come on, let's look at this. It took me a while to dig in to figure out exactly where everything happened, but here we go. So the residence is up here. This is Plantersville. This is the Firefox neighborhood. It's right near 249. And this is where he disappeared, okay? Now, this is an area near the Aggie Expressway and uh, Highway 249. And this is where Tim's property was located. Now, if you look through this area, tons of bodies of water. Tons. Between where Chris disappeared and where he was found, there's actually a neighborhood right here. Now, very odd because it appeared to me that Chris would have had to have gone through or very close to that neighborhood if he walked his way all the way five miles south. Hmm. Suspicious? I'd say so. Now think about something. This is a fact. Somebody can go without food 10, 15 days if you have enough left on you enough extra weight shall we say but if you go without water for three days there's a good chance you're going to die and the smaller you are as a person the less chance you're going to live many days without water now there's a good chance i'm thinking this has to be the case that chris was drinking puddled water in the woods as he was walking along to survive in the decent condition he was in when he was found. It didn't say he did, and there have been no new details about this case since he was found. They've really shut it down. But law enforcement officers from multiple agencies said this was a miracle. I don't care what you say. I don't care what your definition is. But what happened to make Tim go into his property after Bible study and look for this little boy? Where did that message come from? So the people out there, and I know there's many of you that and I get it, they don't believe in God, don't want to hear about God, don't want to hear about spirits, don't want to hear about anything, really. I think just, you want to be entertained by my stories. But it's these stories where people have a dream, people get told or directed to a location. This is not happenstance. This is a directed message. How is this happening? And the message is for the people out there who don't believe in a spiritual entity. People that believe in God, I know what you know. It's those others out there that I'm trying to get through to, that there's something more to this life and this world than just black and white, wake up in the morning, and there's the sun, and when we die, we go into the ground. There's much more to life and our, our spirit than that. Our soul has is a living entity. Last thing is, in this area in Texas, there are a lot of snakes. And just like in every one of the cases involving missing kids, they never get bit by snakes. You and I walk through those woods in bare feet and shorts, <laughs> we'll probably step on a snake. But how do these kids all get through this infested area and nothing happens? I don't understand it. I really don't. So those are the three cases. One more question that was asked of me earlier in the week, and I'll take a shot at it. 
people say, well, Dave, in a lot of these cases that you talk about, weather's an issue. And are the weather-related issues predicted or not? In the instances where I have the ability to go back in time and look for that specific location, I would say it's 50-50. And that's the reason why I tell people to always check the weather before you go into the field and do a hike. As an example, today in northern Montana, the weather said, oh, no, no rain, going to be partly cloudy. I went out today for, I had to go to the store for something, and I'm out, and it just poured buckets. Point being, you got to be prepared for everything. Uh, and people always ask, well, Dave, how could I prepare? One easy, easy way is that uh, I have a poncho and it fits into this little plastic sleeve that it came in. It's about this big and I think it costs $3.99. And it opens up and it, it, it's a huge poncho. And in an emergency, you could just rip that open, put it over yourself, huddle under a tree, stay dry and kneel down and the water will go away from you, which is what you want in a poncho. So weather kills a lot of people. So be careful in the weather issue. In Chris's incident, the weather cooperated with law enforcement and him. But the distance he traveled, canines not picking up a scent, not responding to search and rescue calls for assistance, not coming back to his mom, leaving the scene of the car with a dog. Again, I keep telling people, the number of times children have disappeared with a dog is off the charts. And I've said, I'm missing 411 Eastern US. There's dozens of stories I, I wrote about and all the kids disappeared with the dog. Half the time the dog came back, other time it didn't. In this instance, the dog came back. So why would the dog come back if Chris was still there? Doesn't make sense. Yeah, I get a little frustrated sometimes. And that last letter I wrote, I, I read to you the last letter, I should say this. People say, oh, Dave, did you write those letters that you're reading? No, I've never wrote one of the letters that I've read on, on YouTube. Never, never, never. And trust me, friends, there are so many emails out there that I could pick from that I could be reading these letters for months, and they're all really good. And that last letter where it identifies specific profile points, suspicious circumstances, if you're new to the channel, I have 160 plus videos you can watch. And I really lay, I try to lay the ground look, groundwork for everyone to truly understand what is happening here. And if you're patient, interested, and can focus a bit, then I think it can, it can be understood by almost everyone. So, it's, uh, it's getting late. I want to say thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And I know every villager out there that makes a comment on the video appreciates this too. I've still, still had some angry, angry emails, but 99.9% .9 of the notes that you guys write are really, really polite to each other. And I appreciate that. And uh, we're just all trying to get back here on Earth. We're just trying to live. We're trying to be peaceful, nice, wholesome people. And I know for some, it's a real struggle. I have some of you say, Dave, I, I just can't do this, or I just can't do that. You can't do it right now. But the sun's gonna rise tomorrow. A warmer day is on the horizon and you're gonna wake up with a different mindset. And when that different mindset hits you, that's when you get out of your paradigm 
and you start doing things that are good for you. Doing things that you never thought you could do. Because in our world as humans, really, it's almost limitless what we can do if we just open our mind and allow it to go. If you put up the walls around you and you say you can't do something, it's pretty hard to overcome that. If you become that can-do person, all of a sudden those walls start to come down. Look for positive people to be around you, people that support you, people that say you can do it. Don't let anybody see you can't. You can. Get up, change the paradigm, look out at that sun, enjoy the warmth, and know that you've got friends in these villagers here that will support you. Thanks a lot for being here. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed. <laughs> so many aren't subscribed, but I appreciate you. And if YouTube's willing, I'll be back soon with another edition of Missing 411.